Okay, we're on. So good morning once again, and I uh, hope you all have all had a good week. Um, yeah, I think there are people still coming in, and uh, yes, we can get started. Maybe we'll uh, just quickly start with a word of prayer and uh, submit the next uh, two hours into the Lord's hands. Let's let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you have been with us. Lord, through the last week, through every day, Lord, you are the one who sustains us, who builds us, who keeps us. Father, even as we look into fresh lessons this morning, Father, we submit our marriages, our relationships to you. Lord, we know we aren't perfect um, in any way, but Lord, we cling to you. We cling to your understanding. We pray that the Holy Spirit will bring changes in our hearts and in our lives, in our relationships, so that we could be a people who gives you glory and, and praise. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. Okay, so... Um, uh, would anyone like to start with maybe a few things that we covered the last week? Where we are for the benefit of those who uh, were not able to join us last week. Um, so would someone like to... Would like to um, share? Good morning for all those who, who come in right now. Yeah, anyone? What did we look at last week? Uh, shall I call out some names? Joshua? Good morning, Joshua. Would you like to um, put, up to, put us to speed on what we covered last week? Joshua? Okay, anybody else? Simran? Okay, yes, Avni, thank you. Yes, we did the roles of a husband and wife last time. Okay. Uh, and remember some of the roles that we spoke about for a husband? Anyone? Yeah. Yes, Avni. So uh, we uh, learned about some specific guidelines on roles of husband and wife according to the scriptures. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. we learned uh, uh, some important truth from 1 Peter, 1 Peter 3 7, that we are joint heirs in all that God has for both of us. Uh, none is superior or inferior. None of us earn it, but by grace we receive it. We are all interdependent and we are both designed to be inter, uh, interdependent. Mm, yes. Then uh, we also learned about, we, we do this out of respect for Christ. We mm. are called to be courteous, reverent to one another. Uh, then we learned about wives have to understand and support their husband in ways. And uh, husbands are to go out and love their wife, cherish their wife as he loves himself. He is uh, called to uh, love his wife. Then uh, we are called to be good, be responsive, honor and uh, honor each other, be agreeable in uh, and be sympathetic and compassionate to each other. That's it. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, Avni. Thank you so much for... Um bringing that up okay so i thought as a as a beginning exercise we could um, just take a few a few couple of minutes to uh, really look at some practical ways as how we can look at uh, first corinthians 13 you know it, it it's the chapter of love where it talks about uh, what love is okay so i know there are many of us who are married uh, or or even are you know do have relationships with parents and friends and uh, close significant people so um what i'd like to do is maybe bring up some of those verses and um maybe each of you could unmute uh, one one 
attribute per person, just unmute <clears throat> and look at uh, what are some practical ways as to how you could express this attribute to your spouse or um, to a parent or to a child. Um, you know, we're specifically looking at marriage here, but in, in case you aren't married, um, looking at how you can do this for any significant relationship. So uh, shall we do that? OK, I think it's just, just a little time for us to share practical understanding. We can learn from each other. And uh, so I'm, I'm keen to also learn from, from all of you who are married and how, what are some of the practical ways you would do. Okay, so let's take a few. Let's look at love is patient. How would you practically express this to your spouse? In a few sentences, okay? It doesn't have to be long. Just a few sentences, um, maybe 15, 20 seconds each. Yes, love is patient. Come on, this is this is to interact, okay? This is to learn together to interact. Yes, uh, Anita, go ahead. Uh, we can be good hearers, like, yeah. Okay, good hearers, okay. All right, anyone else would like to add? Rupa? Yes, Rupa, go ahead. Rupa? Uh, Rupa, we can't hear you. Am I the only one who can't hear her? Are the rest able to hear her? Can't hear. Rupa. Can't hear. Okay. Yeah, Rupa, sorry, we can't hear you if you can put it on the chat. Okay, anyone else on patience? Okay, let's look at is love is not jealous? What is a practical way to express this? Love is not jealous. Come on. We've oh. all been in. Yes, Samuel. Go ahead. Go ahead. I think it's, um, it's um, yeah, I, it's, uh, it, for me, uh, it speaks to uh, letting my spouse uh, have the freedom to interact with her friends, with whoever she wants to for the reasonable duration of time that she wants to it, you know, as long as that she's having a good time and not uh, and uh, yeah and so that and the other thing is uh, if I am not having a good time not uh, translating that to her just because she's having a good time with someone else so I think uh, yeah, that is how I would <laughs> okay Thank you. I think uh, Kennedy has written something. He said, correcting them in love and kindness when she does a mistake. OK. All right. Yes, Anita. Appreciating and be thankful. OK. Whatever they are, like instead of being jealous. OK. Appreciating their gifts or things that they have. All right. OK. Um, what about um, love is not irritable? I'm sure we all have examples of this. I have 10, 15 of them coming up to me right now. So maybe I'll, I'll, I'll probably give you this one. So, um, you know, I, I don't know how many, uh, how many people feel annoyed when there are wet towels on the bed. Thumbs exactly. up. That was what coming for. <laughs> <laughs> OK. <laughs> All right, so that, yeah, so when there are wet towels on the bed, um, that I think annoys me to no, no <laughs> end. And I think that's been something that I've been seeing for the last 18 years. Uh, initially, it wasn't very patiently taken. Uh, it was very vehemently taken. But now over years, uh, it's done with, uh, you know, okay, just take it. If that bothers you so much, take it and put it uh, out at the sun or be gentle to say that. Okay, so being careful of that. All right. Anyone else? Love is not irritable? When he just comes from the office and doesn't wash his hands and <laughs> jumps into the uh, corner to eat something and, you know, I'm waiting when will he 
go and um, wash his hands because uh, he is hungry he has been through a tough day and he just enters the office he relaxes and the first thing he thinks is let me eat something <laughs> yeah right okay thank you amni okay uh, one or two more does not keep a record of wrongs how can you practically express this does not keep a record of wrongs come on when there's an argument we make a, a deliberate effort not to remind things that we have gone through in the past and uh, take the thing as it is live in the i mean take it in the present and be more uh, considerate in uh, you know expressing mm -hmm. our anger in the right mm -hmm. way right absolutely yes uh, forgetting the past yes anita or it can be just addressing for once and then again and again like after 10 years also you are still sitting on that and bring out that that should not happen yeah you know there are times that uh, especially in counseling sessions i see that couples bring back issues that have happened on the marriage day you know it it's probably something very simple but definitely has caused a lot of hurt and mistrust but even little events that have happened at the marriage day is still replayed over and over and over again even years after right so yes being able to forgive um i think someone said being forgiving love is not irritable rose is written sometimes we need to overlook the obvious bad and think more of the goal of attaining peace okay all right not look at something that could make you feel irritable okay good wonderful let's look at one more um love endures through everything love endures through everything what could be an example for that through success through failures uh, we stand with each other mm -hmm. and uh, encourage each other and mm -hmm. uh, sometimes it's a moment of uh, just leaving it for that particular point of time and uh, you know once that moment passes away we see that uh, things are better mm -hmm. so controlling mm -hmm. ourselves in that particular uh, spur of moment and letting it go and um, then uh, you know uh, discussing or talking or that way ma'am ma'am can i share can you hear me sorry uh, did someone say something rupa, rupa yes rupa go ahead go ahead uh, ma'am uh, about uh, enduring this patience okay yeah, i endure yeah. through everything okay yeah yeah i had we had a very good uh, relationship my husband and i we really enjoyed a journey together but uh, at one point of time i think about 22 around 21 at uh, 21 years after uh, at that point of time my husband had to go through a he is a medical doctor serving in a, a charitable hospital uh, he had to go through a process very painful process uh, where he was terminated from his job uh, because of the ministry we are doing there and after coming out god was telling him not to move from this place he is a, uh, he was trained in velour and expert Perfect. and waiting like that without doing anything was very difficult for him and it was having a toll everything changed he became very critical and uh, very depressed and it was for almost i think more than 7 years we had to go through that process but god gave me the grace to endure both of us to endure each other i think irritation about talking about irritate irritating being irritated i think it is also where we should be careful not to irritate the other person also you're only thinking from our point of view and saying uh, that we are bearing with the irritation but it uh, we should also be careful not to irritate our partners i think thank you 
Okay, thank you. Thank you, Rupa. Okay, last one. Love is self love uh, is not selfish. Love is not selfish. I'd like to hear from some men maybe. Have all the ladies speaking. Anybody? Come on. One last person. Felix, Christopher. Putting your spouse. Yes, sir. Go ahead. Yeah, I think putting your wife's needs uh, before yours. Not not just about always about I need this. I I need this to be in place, or I, uh, this is my requirement. But I think very often thinking about what does my mm -hmm. what does my wife need to have a good day, or uh, mm -hmm. how can uh, make things better, for, a little better for her. I think uh, that's that could be love is not selfish. Thank you, thank you, Sam. Christopher, you, I think you had on raised your hand too. Uh, yes, um, I think when uh, you know sometimes um, when it comes to uh, uh, food, uh, you know, uh, to to be able to uh, keep aside uh, an extra portion. Uh, you know, for for my wife and she actually does it more often. Uh, you know, particularly food that you know I, we know the you know the other uh, spouse uh, likes uh, likes a lot. So Enjoy. I think that's that's one way of being able to show that you're not selfish. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. So good. So that that's really nice. Not eating the last chocolate. Yeah, or not eating the bigger part of the cake. Right. <laughs> yeah, so that's that's nice. Thank you, thank you all for sharing. I think that that really helps uh, each one of us to just connect uh, a little bit more on on what really scripture says. Okay, um, so we're going to be looking uh, a little little bit more uh, quickly on certain uh, responsibilities. Um, that uh, roles and responsibilities that uh, a leader or a minister um, is spe specifically called to have. So if you look at scripture, it describes um, uh, how, you know, those of us who are specially leading uh, in, in a community, in a local church, or in some area of ministry, how much more the standards and our conduct uh, should be like. So th there are certain um, scriptures that are made, uh, you know, that, that specify that. However, even as I'm saying that, it does not absolve the rest of us from, um, from I mean, even if you are not as a part of a ministry, it does not absolve you from uh, engaging in in these uh, uh, these roles and responsibilities. So, but but this is specifically called out because we are um, uh, examples to to a community of a local church so we need to ensure that we stick on to the word of god and um, what it calls for us okay so i will i'd like to i'm on page um 47 okay so maybe we could have a couple of people read through these verses and then we can quickly um uh, just uh, bring about some key points that that it has spoken about so um one of you can take up first timothy 3 1 to 13 another can take up titus 1 6 to 9 and someone else can take up titus 2 1 to 6 i've just taken the larger portions there are other scripture that's already also there but uh, we'll just take these so first timothy 3 1 to 13 Titus 1, 6 to 9, and Titus 2, 1 to 6. So who'd like to read First Timothy 3, 1 to 13? Could just unmute and, and read. Can I read? Sure, sure, Christopher. Uh, 1 Timothy, Timothy 3, 1, 13. This is a true saying. If a man is eager to be a church leader, he desires an excellent work. A church leader, leader must be without fault. He must have only one wife, be sober, self-controlled, and orderly. He must welcome strangers in his home. He must be able to teach. 
He must not be a drunkard or a violent man, but gentle and peaceful. He must not love money. He must be able to manage his own family well and make his children obey him with all respect. For if a man does not know how to manage his own family, how can he take care of the church of God? He must be mature in the faith so that he will not swell up with pride and be condemned as the devil was. He should be a man who is respected by the people outside the church so that he will not be disgraced and fall into the devil's trap. Church helpers must also have a good character and be sincere. They must not drink too much wine or be greedy for money. They should, not, they should hold to the revealed truth of the faith with a clear conscience. They should be tested first and then if they pass the test, they are to serve. Their wives also must be of good character and must not gossip. They must be sober and honest in everything. A church helper must have only one wife and be able to manage his children and family well. Those helpers who do their work well, win for themselves a good standing and are, are able to speak boldly about their faith in Christ Jesus. Okay, thank you, Christopher. Uh, Titus 1, 6 to 9, somebody else. Titus 1, 6 to 9. An elder must be without fault. He must have only one wife and his children must be believers and not have the reputation of being wild or disobedient. For since a church leader is in charge of God's work, he should be without fault. He must not be arrogant or quick-tempered or a drunkard or violent or greedy of our money. He must be hospitable and love what is good. He must be self-controlled, upright, holy, and disciplined. He must hold firmly to the message which can be trusted and which agrees with the doctrine. In this way, he will be able to encourage others with the true teaching and also sh to show the error of those who are opposed to it. Thank you, Anita. The last one is Titus 2, 1 to 6. Titus 2, 1 to 6, but you must teach what agrees with sound doctrine. Instruct the older men to be sober, sensible, and self-controlled, to be sound in their faith, love, and endurance. In the same way, instruct the older women to behave as women should who live a holy life. They must not be slanderers or slaves to wine. They must teach what is good in order to train the younger women to love their husbands and children, to be self-controlled and pure, and to be good housewives who submit themselves to their husbands, so that no one will speak evil of the message that comes from God. In the same way, urge the young men to be self-controlled. Thank you. Thank you, Rose. Okay, so through the, in these three passages, what you can, you know, there are certain responsibilities conduct standards that um, a leader needs to follow so you know quickly if we could just um, highlight some of that um, for a husband from first timothy 3 2 it talks of a husband having just one wife being sober being self-controlled being orderly um, and be hospitable uh, verse 3 talks about uh, his conduct his character of not being a drunk or being violent and not being a lover of money um, the fourth one uh, a responsibility towards the home that says he needs to manage his own family and have his children obey him that is bringing up the children in the fear of the Lord which becomes a responsibility um, he also needs to be mature in in his own faith um, should be one verse uh, eight should be one of good character he should be sincere all right uh, if you look down to uh, Titus 2 1 to 6 it talks of uh, uh, even Titus 1 talks of similar um, things that is spoken about in first Timothy Titus 2 1 to 6 talks about the older men being sober sensible self-controlled to be sound in their faith to have love to have endurance 
to not be slanderers, to not be slaves to wine, um, and to be able to teach what is good. Okay. Uh, whereas for women, uh, for the wives, the uh, First Timothy three says in verse eleven, wives need to be of good character, must not gossip, must be sober and honest, take on the responsibility of managing the children and family well. Uh, uh, must also, um, if you look in Titus, it looks or uh, it looks of similar things. Um, you know, being hospital, hospitable, being self-controlled, upright. Um, and in Titus two one to six, it specifically talks about loving husbands, being self-controlled and pure, being uh, submissive to their husbands. So, so when you look at at this, there are, uh, you know, the scripture really captures what what should be our lifestyle even um, as we minister on the outside what should be our conduct and our responsibilities at home so that that gives it um, a good picture of what we really need what the standards are for each one of us okay all right uh, i'm just going to take up the question that samuel's uh, brought up here he's written not to derail but i do want to explore the love does not keep a record of wrongdoings we learn from our past we draw important lessons forgetting the past and repeating the same mistakes could be painful how do we bring up the past to draw important lessons without making it look we are record keeping okay so um this this also comes as part of how we we resolve conflicts and um, as, which is something uh, something that we will be looking at uh, in more detail um, to look at it from a practical standpoint is um, whenever there appears a conflict that comes up uh, you know scripture uh, commands us you know don't let your um, you know sort out your anger before the sun goes down so we are called to come to a place of um, uh, you know bringing our hurt and pain first and foremost to God and then coming to a place of lovingly discussing it with with your spouse so what the reason why a record of wrongdoing generally happens is because at the times that things go wrong it is not addressed instantly or it is not addressed at the moment it is either pushed away it is repressed it is suppressed it is kept aside it is bottled and over time it um, accumulates and then there, there comes a release so if we are careful to ensure that everything that we may find offensive and i think that's something you need to understand that in a marriage relationship there may be many things that you may be offended about uh, even if it is something really small it's maybe a smirk it can be a word it can be a comment um, but if not dealt with if not released um, to god and maybe discussed to your spouse there is a possibility that it becomes a record okay and when it is not handled in time that's when these things do come up now what happens to a lot of situations when maybe in the past there has not been an opportunity or maybe we didn't know better that we should have discussed it and brought about uh, the issue which means you are you may be bringing up certain mistakes that continue happening right and uh, uh, bringing bringing it up in first of all um, you know in an uh, within an environment helping your spouse understand that this is not fault finding or this is not um, nitpicking but it is something that you feel uh, affects the way that you address the relationship or you have seen the relationship and as a result you're bringing it up so that you get, have better clarity and you're also probably pointing out something that has been hurtful to you so when you're able to um, bring up something of the past I, th I think there are couple of ways that we bring up things in the of the past or think bring up mistakes 
Uh, so there are two ways that you can bring up. One can seem extremely accusatory, you know, where you're probably saying something like, you know, you, you've done this, you've done this 10 times in the past, you've been doing this all, all these years. Um, this is what, so, so the focus becomes you. It's like, you know, you're pointing a finger. The focus is always you've done this, you're there, you're, this is how uh, you flawed. So that's the focus. So that's one way of expressing it. And often you will find this expression with a defense. You know, the response is always a defense, or it's all, or it could be, um, you know, a throwback uh, on you probably. But a better way of doing it is actually expressing your emotions, your feelings, your difficulties in relation to what the mistake has been, right? So probably it's it's something like, you know, I feel, um, I feel unheard or when, when something like this happens or I feel that uh, uncared for when, when this situation happens over and over again, um, I want to express to you that it affects me. Maybe I haven't understood or I am misinterpreting your actions, but I would like to understand what, you know, where you're coming from. So to exhibit that you're coming from a place of understanding rather than a place of nitpicking and pulling up. Okay, so that that is uh, that always is useful because it not only helps the other person have some clarity about what that behavior or that mistake has done to you, but also looks at ways of how they probably have been, um, uh, you know, their actions have been misinterpreted or misjudged, and they get to to clarify or if they do repent and uh, suggest that you know things have gone then then there is restitution over there so these are some practical ways on how it needs to be done but um um forgetting the past now if if you now let's say let's say in, in the next few situations this has been done yet the mistakes keep coming about then it is taking you know your hurt and your um, things to the Lord and asking the Lord to bring about uh, a change, you know, for, so you, you may not be able to forget the past, but you're not dwelling on it. You're not picking it up. You will remember, okay? Um, you, God has given you a mind, you will remember, but it is still your choice if you want to continue bringing it up back onto the table even maybe when you felt you've done adequately it's been discussed adequately but uh, you know that probably isn't a heed on that then you make it a choice to uh, to not uh, dwell and bring it up and and um, uh, you know continue churning it over and over again you make that choice you may remember it but you make that choice not to dwell but releasing it and letting it go I hope I answered your question, Samuel. Yes, yes, Pastor. Thank you. Right. Okay. Right. So we will we're going to move on into quickly looking at one area um, which is specifically uh, important for building uh, intimacy, as well as a specific role of a husband and a wife, is with the aspect of sex. And we will be covering this um, in in a chapter in detail. But this is specifically here just to point out, um, you know, what is the role of a of a, a husband and a wife when it comes to the place of uh, sexual intimacy. So let's just look at what Scripture talks of. Would Would someone like to read uh, first? 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 1 to 6. 1 Corinthians 7, 1 to 6. And that's on page um, 48, 48 and 49. Someone could read that. Uh, 1 Corinthians 7, 1 to 6. Now, getting down to the questions you asked in your letter to me. First, it is, is it, is it a good thing to have sexual relations? Certainly, but only within a certain context. It's good for a man to have a wife and for a woman to have a husband. Sexual drives are strong, but marriage is strong enough to contain them and provide for a balanced and fulfilling sexual life in a world of sexual disorder. The marriage bed must be a place of mutuality, the husband seeking to satisfy his wife and wife seeking to satisfy her husband. Marriage is not a place to stand up for your rights. Marriage is a decision to serve 
the other, whether in bed or out. Abstaining from sex is permissible for a period of time if you both agree to it. And if it's it's for the purposes of prayer and fasting, but only for such times, then come back together again. Satan has an ingenious way of tempting us when we least expect it. I'm not understand commanding these periods of abstinence, only providing my best counsel if you should choose them. Thank you, Tarun. Right. So if you look at the scripture, there are certain things that it brings about. One is that uh, it, it talks of how in a world of sexual disorder, in a world where sex is misconstrued, is distorted, uh, it serves the purpose of having a balanced and fulfilling sexual life within within marriage. So that is one of the roles so that it, it, you know, you're also not drawn to an immorality, so that it can be fulfilled within within uh, marriage in itself. So that that responsibility lies between the uh, lies in the husband and the wife. The second thing it talks about is it's something that the role is uh, you know mutuality, peop, uh, the uh, husband and wife enjoying it together, and also doing their best to be able to satisfy those needs um, one to another. The third thing that it talks about is not standing up for your rights, you know, not holding back or not using it as a weapon um, uh, against your spouse withholding it for uh, you know for for conflicts or for any other form of a re for other reasons so that's yet another um, responsibility that as a husband and wife that you may have then it talks about in verse 5 it talks about abstaining from sex is permissible only for short periods of time and only when it is it is for specifically for prayer and for fasting and only only for such times and to to ensure that you come back together again so that you know so that the devil who who sees this as a great place of attack um, is not is not given uh, a free hand to uh, to work on on you because that's uh, you know, when when that area is not fulfilled or it is not in a place of balance it definitely keeps um, keeps in crouching at your door so uh, that is a responsibility just as much as other we see other responsibilities enjoying a fulfilling sex life is something that is important to keep both the husband and wife um, uh, together and and one and it's a responsibility each of each spouse has towards the other okay the last part that we're going to be looking at is um proverbs 31 um and and i know this is a very familiar passage for uh, you know for all of us who've who've been in church for long and uh, you know lot lot has been spoken about the proverbs 31 woman and uh, uh, you know it, it puts maybe a lot of stress on the woman of what how and what they should be but you know by god's grace uh, we can we can be where where he's called us to be yet through that i'm not reading that entire thing but yet through that there is also a note for the husbands in that proverbs 31 um uh, see you know that entire chapter there are specific things for the husband as well so i'm just going to highlight some of that um uh, and uh, because when when one longs for a proverbs 31 wife uh, they are also putting themselves on record to be a Proverbs 31 husband. So what was what would that mean? One is in verse 11, it says, her husband puts his confidence in her and he will never be poor. So her husband puts his confidence in her, which means you're doing the best that you can to build trust and confidence in your spouse as a husband. Then verse 23 says, her husband is well known, one of the leading citizens, which means uh, he, is a he is a responsible um, provider of the home, uh, doing things outside to bring um, security and safety in the home for the children. So ensuring that that responsibility is, uh, is something that he follows. Okay. Verse 28, her children show their appreciation and her husband 
praises praises her so um here the, the children show the appreciation to the to the husband right or, or or to the man of the house in in what he does in how he conducts the home how he brings them together uh, so all of this comes as a result of also of the conduct of um, the husband okay verse 28 again her husband praises her so um there again you know praise comes when when there is love and uh, care and cherishing uh, and all of that uh, you would find um like you know look look in a normal uh, look in a situation of a school you know a teacher and a student um uh, the student would love a teacher who cares who who helps who's concerned who has the best interest of the student in mind and you would see the student singing high praises of the teacher right so similarly uh, the the praise comes from from either sides from the husband as well as the wife okay also um, verse 31 says giving her credit for all uh, she does and she deserves the respect of everyone so the husband giving her this credit as well as respecting her for whatever uh, she is for whatever uh, we we see in that entire chapter of what she does so just as much as we need to uh look for a virtuous woman or be a virtuous woman so also the husband needs to be that proverb said one husband that the wife responds to okay uh, uh just before we close i think i just want to at, at part of your application there is a very interesting um uh, uh, tool that you can use in order to know how you express love so there is um uh, there's a person by name dr gary chapman who's written the books of the five love languages um where it describes how we give and we receive love so he's described five specific ways in which love is expressed um the first one being physical touch that is uh, where it's um uh, you know there's a physical affections physical displays of affection really catches the eye of of the of of a person who who has this as their dominant love language okay the second one is words of affirmation where um you are affirming your love through encouraging words through compliments uh through uh, words of um respect through words of praise so that's what words of affirmation is okay the third one is receiving gifts where um uh, you know gifts seem to be a great uh um uh, you know speaker of love uh, and this may not be the uh, uh you know the more than the monetary value it is the 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 careful selection of it and how it has made meaning uh, to the relationship it's it's a lot more of that when when it's about receiving gifts so even even things like you know handing out roses or handing out one or two chocolates or ensuring that you know you bring in something because you've thought of the person it's mean the thought that counts in in that area the fourth one is acts of service in which uh you know doing things doing tasks on behalf of the of the, for the spouse maybe it's um, it's a uh, maybe cleaning it's it's working through some uh, you know doing regular household chores or anything any kind of service um that that uh, makes them feel loved and the last one is quality time where you give undivided attention now what this uh, what he talks about in this um, Uh, in this book is that uh, we all give and receive it differently and often we tend to give it in the same way that we want it or we receive it like for example let's say uh, you know uh, the husband has words of affirmation and receiving gifts as their as his dominant love language so when he expresses love to his wife mm, he expresses it in his dominant language you know he's speaking english whereas uh, probably the wife speaks another language it cannot be understood because she may be uh, she probably has a different language that she's speaking so what 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 this quiz or what this um uh, you know this this small it, it, it there is there are a couple of items over here that you can actually do and what this reveals is the different um ways in which 
love is being expressed and uh, how you meet the needs of the of the spouse rather than uh, uh, expressing love in the dominant language that you may be uh, i mean in the language that you may be dominant for, dominant of so that it's it's a good exercise to do and something that uh, you could probably try out to yourself to to understand and uh, also have your spouse uh, uh, you know, do the test for themselves and being able to see where you all are and find ways of how you best can express uh, love to them in the way that they experience it, in the way that they feel it. Okay, so this is uh, found in that uh, in uh, on pages 40, uh, on pages 51 uh, onwards. Okay, and um, you could probably do that for yourselves and come up with the score and maybe you know share what you have uh, seen through through the through what this reveals to you okay uh maybe we'll just uh, quickly wait for some questions um before we close uh, uh this hour of uh, our class any questions specifically No questions? Any comments? Any feedback? Any anything? Any um, anything that you feel you can you can help to contribute to help all of us learn or pick up? Uh, uh, Ma'am, uh, just uh, trying to understand as like in this. In these times when you know mobile phones uh, they are all the time um, uh, keeps uh, you know professionals busy you know they, they never get off the work and uh, mm -hmm. mails are pouring in messages are coming in the work never stops <laughs> and, mm -hmm. and and undivided attention becomes a challenge like so mm -hmm. you you know that it is important for him to address the issue because it's uh, about the job and pressures are increasing and in these times but mm -hmm. you also want an attention but uh, you know the time just goes by and day after day you know so how do we handle that kind of pressure that's what i want to understand uh i mean the truth is that there is no shortcut to that um and uh, so if if you look at you know if we pass through maybe generations we understand like um, i think times when we were younger it was probably it was a tv right now something else has taken over in a few years something else will take over so there's always distractions that will be there in any form but uh, like I said, there are no shortcuts. There are certain things that um, you know is important for the growth of uh, a home or a, or a family or a relationship. And uh, there needs to be those, those times that's being carved out so that that can be addressed. Uh, there aren't easy, there are, like I said, there's no shortcut. It has to be done. It's like, um, it's like, you know, your three meals a day, you would carve out the time to ensure that something gets in. But that's, or, you know, even, mm, I, I would even say it, say it even, even further for um, your quiet time, right? Because of the kind of pressures that gets eaten up. But that's what requires, that's what discipline is all about, being disciplined to bring to ensure that this is a priority and this is something that you must do and you will do and all else falls down on priority so if we take time to build those priorities or or understand those priorities and learn to practically work through that i think it is possible yes thank you ma'am 
Yeah. Okay. Um, I think we'll we'll uh, we'll close for today's class, and uh, we'll uh, come back in a couple of minutes. So thank you. See you all soon.